Friday night at Colin Pine, this place is packed. Once again, proving what I've known all along, scientists can throw a party. <laughs> Welcome to the fourth iteration of the psychology of Star Trek versus Star Wars. We always have a lot of fun on this panel, um, mainly because we all love all the franchises, but we also love digging into each other, and it's awesome. <laughs> My name is Brian Ward, and I have the uh, distinct honor of moderating this panel. Um, and as always, we are joined by four fantastic panelists. Uh, our resident psychologists, of course, well, well at least for now. Uh, he is the sci-fi psychologist representing Team Star Trek. He, Mind meld. he is the creator of BrainKnowsBetter.com. He is also the co-host of a weekly podcast called Super Fantastic Nerd Hour, which is pretty super yeah. fantastic All right. and nerdy. <laughs> He and his co-host uh, wax philosophic about all things geeky. Um, please welcome Dr. Ali Matu. She is the founder of underthemaskonline.com, and she is also a co-host of her own weekly podcast called The Arkham Sessions, which psychoanalyzes, oh. I like the sound of that. Which psycho psychoanalyzes every episode of Batman the Animated Series. Yeah. Please welcome Dr. Andrea Lenamendi. The force is strong in here. <laughs> We're also very fortunate each time that we do this to have a rotating group of special guests. This. Uh, iteration is no different, and we are very lucky to have these gentlemen uh, representing Team Trek. Uh, he spent 10 years uh, looking at, you know, getting to know his father, Gene, and uh, his father's legacy, and learning a lot about himself in the process. The result was a fantastic documentary called Trek Nation. You can find that on Netflix. Or you could win one tonight. Huh? <laughs> There is also that possibility, and you can go home tonight and watch it. Um, he is also the executive producer of a podcast called Mission Log that also goes into yeah. the episodes of Star Trek and the films. Uh, and he is the CEO of Roddenberry Entertainment and the founder of the Roddenberry Foundation. Please welcome Mr. Rod Roddenberry. And this gentleman's done it all. You know him uh, for his roles in Being Human, Battlestar Galactica. You yeah. might remember him as a corpse in The Walking Dead. Uh, he is also the voice of Darth Maul in Star Wars, The Clone Wars. Please welcome Mr. Sam Witwer. I apologize for my very non-geek attire. I'm um, uh, cosplaying as a douche. <laughs> Andrea, you should probably watch your back because uh, what some might not know is he, uh, he could play both sides. He did appear on an episode of Star Trek Enterprise. Yeah, the dirty secret is I love the hell out of my Trek. That's what's <laughs> happening. You're in trouble. That's okay. You have a double That's lead. This is uh, how our panel works. Um, I've got a series of questions that I will be asking both sides. The psychologists get an opportunity to uh, get all nerdy and science-y, and, uh, and then we let our guests sort of counter those arguments with their own experiences uh, with the franchises. Um, we're actually going to uh, start with round one, self-actualization. We've done three of these panels before tonight, and each one has had an opportunity to touch on um, sort of realizing one's full potential and what that does for someone. So we thought we would actually focus an entire uh, question on it. Um, 
whether it's realizing that you're more than just a kid from Iowa or uh, you know a moisture farmer in Tatooine, uh, both franchises deal with self-actualization uh, qu quite a lot. Um, psychologically speaking, which franchise handles it uh, in a more healthy manner? We'll start <laughs> with Dr. Letamendi for Team Wars. Ladies first, right? Yep. Awesome. Um, well, we know that Star Wars is basically essentially about self-actualization, right? Uh, for folks that have never heard the, the term self-actualization, that's essentially um, the journey to your fulfillment, the journey toward understanding who you are, your purpose, your meaning, um, everything you're basically living for. And so it takes some time to get there. And uh, we know through um, many characters in Star Wars that uh, their individual journeys are really important. That's individual psychology, right? That's the motives, behaviors, perceptions, the experience of the individual. Um, and, you know, I, Star Trek, I think, deals with that, but I feel like Star Trek is more of a societal, kind of psychosocial, larger, um, you know, uh, themed type of uh, universe where it's more about building social relationships and trying to get along and all that. Boring. <laughs> Wars is in the title. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Dr. Mathieu. Yeah, you know, Star Wars has a great story about self-actualization. You know, with these individuals, that's nice. Star Trek <laughs> is about humanity, about this whole species. And the psychology of this, and the real vision here, is about improving humanity, right? There's three basic things that Star Trek is all about when it comes to psychology. It's about overcoming prejudice, promoting tolerance. We have some Andorians here. They helped us out <laughs> to bring the Federation together. The Federation is about groups of people overcoming their prejudice and working on these large goals. That's what Star Trek's about. Star Trek is really about something that's, you know, larger than just individual people. <laughs> Very nice. Well, nice. <laughs> back, to back to Team Wars, Mr. Whitworth. Look, I'm having a real hard time here, guys. <laughs> because much like the two sides of Darth Vader warring with e each other, I also feel like Spock in that I have my Star Trek side and my Star Wars side, and I'm disagreeing with every everyone at this point. <laughs> so, uh, who, 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 are we supposed to win here? Is that how that went? <laughs> yeah? Well, I, I, I'll maybe ask you to no, embrace your this. anger yes. right now. <laughs> go, go, toward, go toward those people. Ah, yes. Much like Darth Maul once said, from before your sun burned hot in space and before your race was born, I, oh, right, Guardian Forever. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, okay, look, let's talk about, let's talk about those individuals that, that you said suck. Um, those individuals, uh, what's wonderful about them in Star Wars is they have more in common with uh, mythic archetypes. They go all the way back to people like Odysseus and uh, you know all those folks, and, and even uh, there's some. <laughs> I read stuff. <laughs> and they were folks. <laughs> I'm trying to stay away from the Greek gods because Star Trek did that as well, right? They're like, well, we had Apollo in our episode. In like every other episode of the original series, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I love that guy. What a cool guy. Yeah. Anyway, so it, it, it has more to do with, um, you know, with, with large myth couched in this wonderful, fun popcorn, Buster Crab, Flash Gordon stuff. And, uh, and it makes those lessons really digestible to young folks. I mean, I remember, you know, in high school, uh, a lot of situations where, you know, you're a young person, you're trying to figure out what's right, what's wrong, and there's always an easy path. And we had a vocabulary to deal with those things, you know? If you'd say, oh, you know, I could do this, and I could, yeah, but that's the dark side, the quick and easy path. You must do the harder thing a lot of times. And, and that, those movies um, provided us that vocabulary with which, with which to uh, digest the world around us in, in, um, in terms that were frankly, a lot more fun than just sitting around and, and gnashing your teeth about being a young person. 
to run there. These guys have already added so much to it. I, I, I got to say, you know, I grew up on Star Wars, believe it or not. You know, I saw it in the theater 10, 20 times when I was a little kid. Um, my intellectual maturity hadn't really developed. However, when it did, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I'm on your side, pal. I'm on everyone's side. I love Go. it. I love it. Um, this is why they keep inviting us back. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, I, I love, I love both sides here. I really, really do. But I'm just trying to, you know, dig the knife a little bit just to stir it up, just sure. to stir it up. Um, you know, I grew up with Next Generation, and, and that, that was my series. And it's funny enough, <laughs> all right, yeah, for, for Mission Log, I just started watching it again. And, uh, you know, first season may not be the strongest season, but <laughs> every, every episode sort of dealt with an issue. And, and it was, you know, one of the difference, and I'm going to argue against, one of the comparisons is Next Generation Deep Space Nine Voyager. You know, Next Generation was, you know, already that better humanity. It was hard for certain people to necessarily identify with those humans because they were what we could be one day. I think a lot of what's in Star Wars is very familiar to us, the behaviors, the, I mean, the, the basic right and wrong, good and bad. It's, I, I'm really not downing it, but it's easier to understand. It's more black and white. And the, the, the Star Trek one is, it, it, it's a little bit deeper, at least for me, because it's a better humanity already. And it, and, it, and it makes me feel good. It ma that's the world I want to live in. That's the future I want to live in. I don't necessarily, although it might be fun, want to live in the Star Wars world. So that's really just where I come from on it. But if you want a war, watch Deep Space Nine. We got a war too. <laughs> it's a really big one with changelings and stuff. Mm -hmm. Let me ask everyone here, what, what's darker? And I'm, this is just me actually asking, because I had a friend who I, I showed a whole bunch of Star Trek to and, and a whole bunch of Star Wars, and she felt Star, Star Wars was a lot darker. And I, I thought that was, I, I thought it was I think it depends. Deep Space is pretty dark. Pretty dark. Deep Space Nine is, pretty is dark. a pretty dark show. Let's, uh, yeah. yeah, let's lie and get the Romulans into the war. So yeah, star, yeah. Spoiler alert, right? Uh, <laughs> best uh, episode ever. That's, Sam, that's my favorite episode of Star Trek right there, In the Pale Moonlight. Wait, so you cool. just earned points. Well, you got, look, Chris if Star, right here, Star Trek is all about the whole thing where, you know, what? We fire on you, but then you fire on us, and then you, and then we come to an understanding afterwards. So I think if I decided to go to war with you guys, Darth Vader don't take no prisoners, man. Yeah. No. no. Just saying, no. It's, it's in your nature to be forgiving. So just be careful. I, I, I don't want to take the gloves off. I don't want to well, do it. Well, this next question will give you the opportunity to do just that, because this is a perfect segue into... <laughs> Uh, realizing one's potential sometimes isn't for everyone. You could have been genetically bred to conquer the earth and be the best of the tyrants, but sometimes you only got a quarter of the earth under your possession before they jettisoned you into space, and you're pissed about that. It's just a quarter of the earth. Mm -hmm. And you could have been given away to uh, a a Lord of the Sith to be his apprentice, and uh, just before you got to realize that potential, you were cut in half. <laughs> and then you're pretty pissed about that. Um, let's talk about these two franchises and what it means to, you know, psychologically uh, be put into this position of merely realizing those goals and then to have it taken away. We'll start with Team Trek, Dr. McCree. Um, this question is pretty awesome. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, Poor con, man. I was just saying, um, my... My favorite part about Phantom Menace is Darth Maul. I think he was such a cool character. And then the scene brought back in Clone Wars was so exciting. And then we, too, on the Star Trek side, have Khan. And he was brought back, too. But we don't have to talk about that. <laughs> what we're talking about <laughs> is what happens when you're, you have a goal. You know, both of these individuals were bred for one purpose. And Darth Maul maybe wasn't bred, but from an early age, you know, without really much choice, he was raised to be this Darth Sith assassin. Uh, Khan was really engineered through eugenics to become this superhuman. And in Space Seed, they say he was the best of them. He was the best superhuman. For both of these individuals, they had a singular purpose. Khan wanted to real, rule the world to, you know, be a good ruler and all of that. And he didn't really do a good job, sort of led to World War III. Um, 
But then Darth Maul was bred for this one purpose of killing Jedi, and as Brian so eloquently said, he was cut in half. Both of these characters become consumed with one thing, and that's revenge. It, they are absolutely consumed with revenge. Khan wants it against Kirk. Maul wants it ag uh, against Obi-Wan, and we see that in Clone Wars. So th the psychology here, you know, it, co it comes down to that line, I've done far worse than kill you. I've hurt you, <laughs> and I want to go on hurting you. That's it, terrible. Revenge is all about <laughs> having this wound and hoping that if you get back at that person, it's going to somehow fix the wound. And what we know about the psychology here is at first, revenge feels good. You know, revenge is a dish best served cold with a little bit of sugar on it because it actually feels good <laughs> in the moment. But what the research has shown is the more you're stuck on revenge and you're ruminating on these thoughts, that pain, that wound, the rumination about how angry you are at Obi-Wan, and how angry you are at Kirk, it just festers. So compare this against Luke and Kirk. Now, Kirk lost his son to Klingons. Those Klingon bastards, they killed my son. I'm never going to, I don't know what he says next. Forgive him, I don't know. <laughs> Something. Spock walks in and them Spock says, what you about me? Um, but Kirk, throughout Undiscovered Country, is going through this process of forgiveness and trying to find empathy for the Klingons. And then you have Luke, who had his hand cut off by, by Vader, and the Emperor is saying, you know, give in to the dark side, and he doesn't. Both those characters are able to find forgiveness. Both those characters are able to develop empathy. They're not saying it's okay that these things would happen, but they are able to find a way to move on. These characters are not. Drea? Uh, well... I just, I just want to comment on uh, my feelings that while I understand Khan's feelings of revenge, it biologically or neurobiologically is a bit superficial. So when we, we keep ending the story at when, when Darth Maul is cut in half, what happens after that? There is this, there's this um, recovery process, right? But there's this um, very um, interesting and I think realistic psychological transformation that happens and that we see unfold in the Clone Wars and something that actual research in uh, neurobiology tells us is that when we have that kind of severe physical and psychological injury there's actually changes in the brain so you hear that that phrase um, you know trauma causes brain damage or um, you know the body never forgets or the body keeps score that's what we're seeing in, in the you know, psychological result when we finally encounter Darth Maul in that junk planet on Lothar Minor, and he's just completely psychologically disoriented, dysfunctional. He's, um, he's nearly psychotic. I mean, he, he really, and I, I wanna uh, really recognize Sam for characterizing that level of um, psychopathology, that it, it really, you could really feel that level of dysfunction, and, and you did a great job with that. Um, but I, I think that that speaks to the neurobiology of that experience of failure and trauma and stress. And it's hard to watch, but it, I thought that was very realistic. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, first, I'm just going to say this. I'm the worst teammate ever, because I'm going to reveal something here that is going to give Star Trek fans a lot of glee. So I'm sorry. Because what you said was beautiful, and what you said was was where I'm going to go with this. When we were this when is great. I really don't have to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> so when when we were when me and Dave Filoni were talking about Darth Maul, we talked about the whole arc all the way through before we actually recorded anything. And one of the things that we kept uh, touching back on is I've done far worse than kill you. I've hurt you. Uh, the whole thing with Khan. And so we have the when we first meet him, he's crazy. Then he gets his stuff back together, and all he wants to do is beat up Obi-Wan and, and kill him real quick. And he wins. He beats Obi-Wan, but then lets him go because he realizes, I don't feel any better. I don't feel any better. Uh, maybe, the re maybe it wasn't big enough. Maybe the revenge needs to be larger, bigger. So he starts raising an army, doing all these things, figuring out who Obi-Wan cares about, and then eventually finds Satine and... No spoiler alert there. I'm going to gonna leave that. But he ends up hurting Obi-Wan in a very major way. Obi-Wan demonstrates his superiority by not seeking revenge, which is disappointing to Darth Maul. But we never get to that point because then suddenly we get to Darth Sidious and there's a whole other revenge plot that happens there. 
It's this endless cycle that, that happens. And I'm, I'm certain that if we had seen Khan more in TV series or the movies, we would have seen something, a recurring revenge cycle for Khan as well, because it's a wound that never, ever heals. The only way that you can heal it is by forgiving your enemy, by, by offering a compassionate response, by offering mercy. And, and there was no mistake that one of the first things we ever heard Darth Maul say in that garbage pit, he's mumbling to himself about how mercy is a lie. And the last thing we hear Darth Maul say is he's begging Darth Sidious for mercy. And Darth Sidious doesn't give it to him. So, so thank you, Star Trek. Thank you, Drea. Thank you, everyone, for <laughs> feeding that response. Uh, I suck at this. I <laughs> well, remember about the rule of two, it's, it's usually, you know, broken. There's usually a third party in the rule of two. Mm. So I'm, I'm okay with that. <laughs> I know I'm betraying I my know own I'll kind. Be betraying. The Sith should really drop that rule of two. It hasn't really worked out too well for you all. <laughs> I, I gotta say, I come at this from a slightly different uh, point of view, and it's really, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of respect for Khan. Um, you know, in, in Space Seed, they have it. Even in the latest movie, they kind of show it. There's 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 a lot of depth to the character, and I didn't know I don't know much about Darth Maul except from the movies. Mm -hmm. So you actually learn quite a bit from you just just now. But you know, Khan, I, I, I guess I have a respect for him. He loves his family. He loves those, those 72 other people. That's his family. So he has compassion. He has a heart. His views are a little screwed up. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I really, really find him to be a, a more intriguing character to me, whereas I think Maul was more one-dimensional. But I know more about Khan than I do Darth Maul. So, um, but that's, that's just where I come from on this. Sometimes you can look at someone who has sort of the wrong point of view but you can still understand them, and you can still appreciate where they're coming from on it. So, and that's that's where I live with with Khan. Yeah, you know, I think one of the primary differences between Star Trek and Star Wars is Star Wars paints in more primary colors, and 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 it's it's louder and it's bigger generally. Whereas Star Trek likes to get really nuanced in very specific ways. That's why I love both of them. And it's hard to do that with theatrical versus television. Well, exactly yeah. right. It, that's absolutely true. Which you know. And it's, it's nice to see that they actually, you know, in those six movies, did have a lot of success with that nuance, especially with Khan. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's, uh, it's interesting that, you know, like Star Wars performances, they don't work if you do them subtly. They just don't. Star Wars is better when it's bigger and faster and operatic and giant. Star Trek is actually, I think, better when it's considered and you have these subtle moments with the characters. Mm -hmm. and Kirk and Spock and Bones in his quarters talking pro a problem out, you know, it's... It's an interesting thing. It makes me want to know more about Darth Maul, though. I want to sit around a coffee table with him, or I want some characters to surround. Luke, <laughs> we'll get a couple around, and they'll just talk philosophy. Let's see, that would Khan be and Maul ha talk it out a little bit. Ooh, that'd yeah. be good. All right, nice. who would win in a fight, Khan or Darth Maul? All right, your hand went up. I, there was no right answer again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think Khan would win against Maul. I, now, I I'm going go, to give an Before. assist to Dr. Letamendi over there. there Let here, oh, uh, here we go. <laughs> Let's, Thank you. Put, let's put let's put Here, this one to bed right you, now. I, I gotta so. say one thing, Brian. What beat Khan in TOS? A big pipe. <laughs> Come on. Well, no, 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 no. No, 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 not just a pipe, my friend. I saw Kirk at one point take both of his fists and combine it into one fist <laughs> and that, strike him several times. That that's something you learn in Starfleet Academy. That's it's, what I saw. It's the Starfleet what? fist bump. Have you ever seen this? You guys watch UFC. One fist can do a lot of damage. This it like it square square root of Austin. I mean, this is what happens. There's a there's a lot of slash fic going on here. Um, <laughs> but but these two would never meet because Star Trek in the future, Star Wars Galaxy. Long, long time ago. Y yeah, but they've what? gotten really good with warp speed. They could go yes. to that galaxy. <laughs> that is true. You in fly the around the, the planet, planet Brian. Really they can go far, speed. far away. Yeah, come on, slingshot effect, man. Let's yeah. do this. Well, we brought we brought this up a little bit in the last question, and now I want to touch on a little bit more. Rules of two, and then the number ones. Um, we can talk about. Uh, the mentoring and apprenticeship in both of these. Uh, 
whether it be their captains and uh, you know with Picard and Riker, or, or whether it's Sidious and Maul, or uh, you know you can choose from any number of them. Let's talk about what we know about uh, training and education and which system is better. We're going to go uh, back to Drea. Um, I'll start it and then I'm going to uh, tag team Sam because um, he's got something great to say about this. But <coughs> something I never understood. So, of course, folks know what the rule of two is, right? Yes. Um, usually, usually there's... Um, a master and an apprentice. Master and an apprentice. Ooh. <laughs> um, and like I said, uh, a lot of times with um, with a Sith, it's violated. There's usually like a secret other apprentice that then kills one of the other two. It's like a little little infidelity. Uh, a little bit uh, dark. But um, despite that, I, I think there's still that classic kind of relationship where the mentor is trying to instill some kind of um, you know, intellectual, emotional, physical ability in, in the mentee. And there's that, um, you know, there, there's kind of that need to, to perform and, and to really make that mentor proud of them. And I think with, with Star Trek, I never really, you know, there are times when, um, you know, let's say Riker uh, he was actually offered his own ship and then Picard was like, you know, well, I guess if you want to do that. And then Riker didn't immediately take that opportunity. And I think it's because... Well, you get paid less. If you leave oh, the show, really? yeah. So <laughs> if you leave the show, that makes sense. The well, economics on. of the future oh, are a little different. Yeah, well, it's true. Are you guys saying you want to Riker off the show? I didn't. I'd be like, don't take the ship. Stick around. He's got a cool beard now. Come on. <laughs> so I don't know about their relationship. There was like too much enmeshment or attachment. You know, when 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 the bird is ready to fly, they leave the nest. So, Sam. Um. Let's talk about. Let's talk about the master and apprentice relationship between, say, Ben and Luke, and then Ben's uh, replacement once he got killed, Yoda and Luke. Um, <clears throat> there's a real thing that happens in Star Wars where Luke is impatient, and he doesn't really listen to everything that's told to him. And Yoda's trying to say, hey, chill out and relax, and people can take care of themselves, and it's not all about you. And, and Luke can't see that point of view. In fact, The Empire Strikes Back really is about respect your elders. And Luke doesn't do that. And because he doesn't do that, he goes off to try to rescue his friends, and then his friends have to end up rescuing him. And he almost blows the entire plan. I mean, he, he almost loses uh, the entire movie series for us in that one impatient move. <laughs> then the next movie is interesting because it's about the opposite. It's about reject your elders. It's about move past your elders. It's about you've become a man or a woman. You've grown up. You are now actualized. Because Ben and Yoda, you know, you must face Darth Vader again. And he's like, well, wh what are you, you're saying kill him. Well, I just face him. Yeah. <laughs> wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. <clears throat> you, I, you know he's my dad. Uh, yeah, I, I do. Kill him? Yoda, what do you think? You must confront Vader. And you're like, you guys are dicks. What's wrong with you people? What is wrong with you people? And they're like, well, listen, we saw him kill a bunch of children, and he was a terrible husband, and he's a total gothy bitch. <laughs> and uh, uh, we think you should, like, just uh, take care of it. It'll be fine. And he's like, no, dude, no. I've gotta, I don't know what my solution is yet, but I'm going to figure something out. That's what Luke does. So the next movie literally is about reject your elders. It's the opposite message of the previous movie because Luke is now an adult. He's a man. He has grown past that mentor relationship, and now he's ready to make his own decisions. And what does he find? He figures out a solution that no one thought of, which is a compassionate solution, a Star Trek-like solution. And, uh, and through that, we get a very, very satisfying ending, an ending that we wouldn't get if, you know, from, from really, it, it was a brave ending, you know, how to, to make that Darth Vader character into a, com uh, a sympathetic character and to make Luke into someone who was brave enough to have compassion for him. Um, I've just learned so much. Yeah. <laughs> does, does Sam win a DVD? What's that? Does Sam win a DVD now? <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know the funny thing? I already own this, but I'm going to give it to someone. Oh, here. Yeah. Yes! <laughs> does anyone have a bottle of something that's not open yet? Because I've got a bottle opener. Huh? Huh? The Enterprise bottle opener. Right, does everyone... I will later. 
It is. What does he make? Yes. There you go. Ali and Team Trap. How do I follow up any of that? <laughs> um, yeah, that was psychological torture on its own, right? Yeah. <laughs> there are four lights. <laughs> Okay. Uh, th All right. There um, are five. <laughs> so um, uh, I agree with with both of you. So let me take this in a different direction because I need to I need to do that. So um, <laughs> this question is really one about training education, right? How do we create the next generation of Sith and Jedi and captains? So both <coughs> series have an academy. And both series have a mentor type relationship. And if we look at the psychology of education, it actually shows that a lot of the former lecture style teaching that happens in academia, there's not a lot of evidence to support that. Um, what works really well is actually learning from your peers and also having some type of mentor available to help you clarify and, and go through the stuff you're learning. Both series do that really well. They have a Jedi Academy, Starfleet Academy. Um, and we see people go through this, whether it's Luke or Wesley um, or Nog. Um, we see this with a lot of different characters. Um, but Star Trek does it better. Here is why. Okay, number one, number one. We, both series have aptitude tests, right? It's like the SATs. Both of them have it. Um, in Star Trek, we've got the Kobayashi Maru. Check out YouTube for episode one of this panel series where we talk about that. Um, and then Wesley has to go through a psychological test as well. Star Wars, you guys have an aptitude test as well. It's a blood test. <laughs> it's looking for midichlorians. <laughs> and we know tests like that aren't really as successful. In Star Trek, the tests are character-based tests. How do you respond to this situation? Star Trek's about integrity, and Star Trek's about equal opportunity. You don't have to have, you don't have to be off the charts on your midi chlorians. You can be a Ferengi, and you can still be in Starfleet. That was extremely offensive, racially. You can still be a Ferengi. You can, really? Really? There, so, so technically, they're not members of the Federation, so yeah. <laughs> wow, bro. I, I, I gotta wow. say, I, I think I might agree with Star Wars a little bit. Like, I love your response, so I'm, I'm, I'm on your side, but the, 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 one thought, the one thought that I really had, uh, you know, if, if you're a member of the Federation, you have to abide by the Federation laws. Starfleet has rules and regulations. And I'm specifically thinking of like Riker and Picard. There wasn't much growth in the characters, not as much as Luke and Yoda. And so they, they don't necessarily have to abide by any set rules. They, they're, they're life rules, the force rules. They, they, they understand that, that everyone's going to have a different journey. The Federation really regulates. So I'm, I'm kind of a little bit on the Star Wars side, at least in that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to balance respect. this out. I'm going to balance it <laughs> well, out. Hold on, hold on. Rod, Rod, I'm not Rod, against you. Rod, not, Riker grew a beard. How much more <laughs> growth do you want? Yes. Yes, he did. Wow. And then Will Wheaton grew a beard. So, uh, what was I saying? Uh, okay, so the, the interesting thing in terms of the way that these two franchise uh, behemoths display this, thi this thing is like, Star Trek, I feel like, taught me a lot about patience and that process you're talking about. In that there really was a, a feeling of, there's a great deal of experience you need to have before you captain a ship. And even when you captain a ship, you are looking to your friends, who are your subordinates, but you're treating them like equals because they have knowledge that you don't. They have wisdom that you don't. And you add that to yourself before you make a decision. You know, it's, it's a fascinating You would have had like 900 years of wisdom. Well, there's that. <laughs> but, you know, and then Star Wars is really more about you have a, you know, the relationship with your father or your parents is not what you hoped it would be. And can you forgive them for it? You know, those are these two different types of learning there. And I think they're both very useful for, you know, for young minds, certainly. Um, so, what? <laughs> Trying to bring balance to the force, dude. 
<laughs> Damn. Without dark, there can be no light. That's right. <laughs> okay, we've got one more question from here, uh, and then I want to go and ask uh, the audience. We've got about 15 minutes, so we'll have to keep this one relatively tight. Um, but I want to talk about a little bit, because we've never actually done this. We've never, someone got very excited. We're, we're, yeah, we're, <laughs> just wait till you see where I'm going. Um, we've never really done this. I, I, we've been talking about the visions of the two franchises, but I want to talk about their creators. Um, I, I want to talk about Gene Roddenberry and his vision for humanity in Star Trek, and I want to talk about George Lucas and his vision uh, in Star Wars. Um, you know, where, what do these two franchises say? I feel like Star Wars has a handicap on this. Like, like every, all the questions have really been, and maybe just because I'm coming from the Star Trek side, have really been on the Star Trek side. I'm, I'm loving this. <laughs> I'm loving this. Go ahead. <laughs> well, 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 we'll totally start with Team Trek. I, I think I'm going to allow my esteemed colleague, Rod Roddenberry, <laughs> to take the lead on this question. Yeah, well, you know, obviously I wasn't around for... Uh, for the original series, um, but I did learn a great deal about my father um, uh, since then, and I do every day in terms of his philosophy. Um, I can tell you, obviously, the difference between the original series and Next Generation was really a difference in my father. I mean, you guys, anyone out here who's seen it, you, you see the, the cowboy Kirk versus the, 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 the Picard who just wants to sort of shepherd ambassadors from place to place. Um, that was really a maturing of my, my father. I know that came out in sort of a derogatory way, but, you know. I, I kind of like Picard. Yeah, I, I, I actually like Picard, too, but uh, the, the action wasn't there. But, you know, that, that's the difference between my father in his 40s and in his 60s. And um, I know that my father had a, an incredible life. You know, he was a World War II pilot. He was a LAPD officer. Um, he wrote uh, speeches for the chief of police when they were trying to, you know, bring the, the, the police LAPD and the, the community closer together. He was, he was thinking about those things then. I mean, he saw the worst that humanity had to offer, and he saw the best that humanity had to offer. And it was with that perspective that he had that he was able to sort of build these philosophies. And um, he, he infused them into the show. Um, I, can't, I can't, you know, everyone puts my father on a pedestal. And he did create Star Trek, and he did help shape it. There were so many others who were involved that made it what it is. But, you know, this, this is why, if you guys know me, I brand everything Roddenberry. Well, first, because CBS won't let me use Star Trek. But, um, <laughs> but, but I'm really in love with the philosophy. I really love what the series teaches, teaches us. And I think it teaches us all something a little different, but it does teach us that we need to not tolerate each other, but we need to truly accept each other and find beauty in the differences between us. And that is just something that resonates so powerfully with me. And it's something that I work on every day because sometimes I'll see someone and I'll hear them say something and I'll go, they're full of shit. But then I gotta think, wait a second, they might have a point. And that's, that's how we grow as a species, by hearing things that are contrary to our thoughts and being willing to accept those. So that's, that's my father, that's Star Trek, that's what I see in the show, and that's what if anyone changes that in any future movies or TV shows, I'm going to be really pissed off. I, I, got <laughs> See, one, one, quick one quick thing to add there. I think uh, the story of Gene Roddenberry is a story of resilience. Uh, this is an individual who did go through s and saw a lot of horrific things, whether it's World War II or working as a police officer. And he was able to survive those things, to endure them, and to grow as a person. And I think that experience must have in some way influenced the story of Star Trek, which is a story about resilience and working to better ourselves. Mm -hmm. Team Wars? I, I completely agree. I, I think that... What uh, is wrong with this man? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, hold on for a second. Hold on for a second. You're I'm asking us to get competitive when we're sitting next to the guy's kid? Come on, man. <laughs> That's the best kind. Well, I don't get it. Uh, go. <laughs> I'm a ginger. I have no soul. 
Hey, listen, listen. I, I just said it. I, I, I want to hear contrary ideas. I you want will. someone. To, I you want will. someone to tell me Star Trek sucks and tell me why. I, I don't think it sucks. Okay. I, I think what you said is completely valid. It's a. It's. I feel the same way. Um, I think that, and I. I sort of. I actually hate the verses thing. I know that the title of this panel that it has verses in it, but. Um, I think that these are, um, both Star Trek and Star Wars is meaningful to us in different ways. That, I, I almost hate the idea that people think that Star Wars is just a space opera or just, you know, a bunch of cowboys in space or whatever. Um, there, I think, uh, George Lucas, uh, had this almost idea to create this, these worlds out of escapism, out of this need for us to kind of get outside of where we are and, and who we are even in order to kind of be in this fantasy world and get excited and get hopeful and, and you know, kind of get lost in it. Um, it wasn't meant to be, uh, you know, a, a premonition or a prediction of where we're going to be. I think it's a way for us to kind of get outside of where we are in order to kind of cope with what's going on. Whereas Star Trek is almost this, um, you know, there are all of these messages in there about um, a, a, a universe where we can sort of be able to collaborate and 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 coexist, and folks uh, who are currently disenfranchised and disempowered and, and feel that they're overlooked are hopeful that one day we'll get there. So I feel that that that's completely meaningful to us in a different way. That we sort of need to. I need to watch Star Wars to not think about um, the fact that we're not there yet. Mm. If that makes there's sense. There's an interesting contrast, I think. And I, I'm speaking completely out of school here. I don't know this for a fact at all. But I'm going to say it anyway, because I'm wearing a tie. <laughs> um, it seems to me that, that your father, when he wanted to make Star Trek, he had some things to say, and he wanted to slip it into these sugar pills and, and you know, get the audience to digest it without knowing what they were consuming. You know, it seems to me that that was a real ambition. Um, George Lucas, I don't think when he started, quite had that ambition. I think that all artists feel the need to create something. We don't exactly know why, we just do. And then the deeper the artist is, the more that interesting things slip into that creation. You know, it's like the difference between Alien and Prometheus. <laughs> alien, well, let's start with Prometheus. Prometheus, they're like, blow your mind. We are so deep. Do you get it? Do you, you don't get it. Do you get it? <laughs> we don't get it. We do get it. We did. Did you get when we said we didn't get it? That was to get you to get it. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> and then they didn't get it. <laughs> the thing about Alien is it was just a bunch of dudes getting together like, let's make a horror film. <laughs> but they were deep dudes and ladies. And Sigourney Weaver's deep, and all these people, you know, and suddenly these things slip into that horror film, and suddenly we go, oh my God, look what they were doing, look what they were saying. Well, they didn't quite know it at the time. It was almost ac an accidental process. Star Wars, Darth Vader was supposed to die at the end. You guys know that? The main character of the entire series, that they did a whole TV series on, was supposed to die at the end of Star Wars, and George Lucas had some weird instinct, like, uh, you know what, can we just do a thing where he spins off into the uh, distance? <laughs> Because uh, if you can't, you're fired. Uh. <laughs> and then, around the time of The Empire Strikes Back, he's sitting in a hotel room, and this is not entirely substantiated, but there's a lot of theories about this. He's sitting in a hotel room, and there are scenes in the script... Watching the Star Trek, by Watching the way. Star Trek, which he did. <laughs> he was watching Star Trek. He admitted that there's influence. Anyway, um, he's watching Star Trek, and he's, he's got a script in front of him that he's rewriting, that he doesn't like to do the whole writing thing, and, and he sees there's Anakin Skywalker is a ghost talking to Luke Skywalker about Darth Vader. And then, around a certain date, Anakin Skywalker disappears from that script. And then no one's talking about Anakin Skywalker in the same way, quite, and, no one, you know, and suddenly there's misinformation. And it's that at some point, he was sitting in his hotel room writing, and he came up with this idea, and he called up his wife and goes, hey, uh... Anyway, Anakin Starfader, I think I made us a million dollars. 
The thing is, the point is that George Lucas's uh, the things he was putting into those movies, I think, were incidental to what he was doing. I think it was because George has things that he thinks about. George has things that are important to him. And if you're going to make a fun popcorn movie, those things are going to slip in. Roddenberry, I think, was a little bit more considered, which is, I think, exactly why these two franchises, you know, they're both, they both engage both sides of the brain, right? Both of them. Hugely creative, hugely intellectual. Both of them have that. I think Star Trek is a little bit more left brain. Star Wars is a little bit more right brain. And uh, There's and also hundreds of hours of Star Trek. Right. By comparison. <laughs> Just give yeah. Disney a few years. And <laughs> Just... <laughs> Yeah. While well, Paramount and CBS sit on their ass, yeah. yeah. From the makers of Prometheus, the next <laughs> Star Wars. All right, so I'm not going to work for those guys ever, am I? I, mean, I? I just really blew it. Anyway, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting that, that uh, you know, in terms of the, it seems like the difference between these two men might have been that. One was a little bit more, I just want to make a fun popcorn movie, and he's going by instinct. And then the other one was like, I got some things I got to talk about. I, I know we need to do Q&A. Quick thing, uh, we, we actually got to interview George Lucas for this, which was fantastic. And um, I, I did ask, you know, sort of, what, I didn't ask what is Star Wars about, but he did say, you know, the, the son redeems the father is sort of that key message. At least that's what he said to me. And, and I did have the opportunity, I did ask, I was like, does, is that somehow correlate, is that, is that in your life? You know, was there anything, I didn't ask about his father specifically, but does that correlate? And sadly, this story I have has no ending. He, he sidestepped it and brought up his son and how, I don't, he didn't say anything, but I don't know, I don't, well maybe after the last few movies, maybe his son does need to redeem him, but whatever. Um, I'm just kidding, just kidding. Too soon, <laughs> too soon. <laughs> but anyhow, it, it, it was just interesting and, and I never got an answer, so sorry. We'll do Q&A. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna do- Who liked that answer? We're going to do it like a lightning Q&A because we've got less than five minutes. Sure, so who's got good questions? I saw your hand first. Um, I actually got myself actually making because Star Wars is all about it, which I totally agree. But I wanted to hear your thoughts on the general categorization of Star Trek in the new movies. I mean, I feel like there's a lot with Spock and with Kirk and actually trying to use two very different angles, two for validation. Okay, so yeah. Real quick, uh, the, the 2009 movie, you see Kirk going through that process of self-actualization and trying to find meaning and purpose in his life. The other thing I love about both the new movies is uh, Spock's journey. And you see Spock um, and what, what it was like for him to be um, the only half Vulcan, half human on, on Vulcan and his growth and his process and his growth towards being embracing more of his humanity side. So both those movies do a fantastic job of that. Okay. All right, who's uh, gentleman there? In, yep. Who would win in a fight? Okay, I'm cutting it off. <laughs> <laughs> We're going, Jeff Sarah in the blue. Our retired Navy commander, which means I'm part of the generation that missed the significance of the US until it was in reruns. 1978, a young sailor down here in San Diego, room full of sailors. 30 guys every Sunday night watching TUS reruns. What do you think it is about that that appeals to that warrior mentality? That's, that's, a, that's a great question. I, um, I obviously can't speak for them. I've, I've never served. Um, I, I'd like to think the hopeful message, but I'm, I'm sure just the, the, the atmosphere of the show itself, the fact that they are on a bridge, they are on sort of a, a Navy ship, at least in the future, I'm sure that appealed as well, but uh, I, I would like to, you know, there's a lot of fans, Iraq everywhere, that, that say they love Star Trek, and I, I'm, I'm hoping they, they want to live in that future, and I hope they believe, and I, and I believe, that they are there to, in some way, bring us closer. Uh, again, I'm not supporting one way or the other, I just think, uh, they think they're doing the right thing for us, I hope they think they're doing the right thing for the future of the entire planet. Um, that's a relative statement. I, I, I can't really, it's going to be too big of a discussion to go any deeper into that, but uh, that's, that's what I hope. Sorry. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, seven of nine. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 question for Carla. Which franchise do you think portrays women and strong women characters better? Oh, man. <laughs> Wait. Are, 
Are there any women in Star Wars? There are like three women, right? Aren't there? But There's like all, three but, women in Star Wars. But One of them's a dancer. Guns. Tread, tread lightly, Rod. Have you seen Star Trek Into Darkness? <laughs> the, it, you know, it, yeah, there, there is definitely a lot. In those th the original three Star Wars, there's definitely a lack of, of female characters, but the one that steps up in front and, and is front and center, my God, she changed everything, I think, cinema you know, cinematically for women. I mean, here's a girl who, you know, she's a damsel in distress, and the boys go to rescue her, and she ends up rescuing the boys. She's give me that gun. Boom, we're going to do it this way. You know, I thought that was wonderful. You know, what a great, awesome twist, especially for that time. And then, of course, for the Clone Wars, Ahsoka Tano is basically the main character of the show. And you get to watch her grow from a, from a, from a kid into a teacher. And that's a very interesting um, evolution. But then Star Trek, of course, and I'll let you take this, uh, had some very progressive ideas very early on. Mm -hmm. number, number one in the original yes. pilot. Right. Uh, was played by who? Who played number one? Well, some might know her as Loxana. I know her as mom. Okay, one more. She was sleeping with the producer, you know. <laughs> In case you guys didn't know that. Thanks. You have a good piano. We'll get a little extra time. All right. Yes. They're very nice Thank to you, us. Thank you, Comic Con. Sir. Going back to your. Uh, That was around the time of Temple of Doom, and that definitely explains the tone of that movie. Um. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. Temple of Doom is also a George Lucas prequel. Uh, to Raiders. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, found that explains a lot I as well. Temple of Doom came out, did, was it before Jedi, the Temple of Doom came out, or was it after? I think it was before, right at around before. Return of the Jedi, or before Return of the Jedi, I think is when that happened. And I'm certain that, yes, after that, he's like, I, I think I want to make three movies where everyone dies. <laughs> um, having said that, you know, it's not widely known that, that The Clone Wars was George's show. He, didn't, he, he wanted sort of the credit to go to Dave Filoni, and, and boy, Dave deserves <coughs> it. George was there every week, and those stories, just about every one of those stories was George's. So you can see that guy had a lot to say, some of it bright and happy, and some of it was not so happy. So, yeah. Right, another question? Over here, yes, ma'am. Um, for any or all of you up there, what is your favorite aspect of the series that you're not currently experiencing? Wow. <laughs> Ewoks. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm probably one of the. The three of us who really loved Return of the Jedi, like was like not my oh, favorite, it. but it, like almost up there. I'm with you on that. Okay, and I love the Ewoks. I want one as a pet. <laughs> you saw them as pets? <laughs> Even an Ewok can join Starfleet. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right? I, you know, there, it's, it's a pick, to pick one thing about Star Trek that I love is too difficult. It's, and be, because there's just hundreds of hours of it. But, but you spent all of tonight defending Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> nah, it's, it's a, I don't like it. I don't like it. <laughs> uh, I, I will say uh, that this whole idea of using the Force and trusting in your instincts and what you see on that Death Star run, bom, 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 bom. in that moment, um, Luke has to find mindfulness. He has to become completely present in the moment. Let whatever thoughts and judgments about, you can't do it, you can't do it, Luke. Let that go away, embrace the moment, and trust his instinct. Man, that had a huge effect on me when I saw Star Wars. I saw Star Wars first before Star Trek, and I thought it was really cool. Scary, but cool. But I think it paved the road for me to see Star Trek and embrace it for what it was. I'm gonna I'm gonna say something, Kirk, Kirk. The fact that you know we talked about how the, the Klingons really kind of messed him up, yeah. but even the guy that killed his kid, he had an instinct to try to help him when he had him had the advantage. He had an instinct, even though he hated the guy. He's like, come on, 
let me I, I want to say the same thing about Luke. I mean, Luke and Dirk. I mean, it, he never gave up hope. He always, you know, cliche, saw the good. And that was, I love that. Um, I really hate Ewoks. <laughs> wait, <laughs> wait. That wasn't, Ewoks. that was, I uh, had some, uh, no, I, <laughs> I actually, I really like Star Trek and something that um, there's, I don't know if it's an obvious thing, but um, the idea of inclusion. Um, you know, I, I absolutely love watching the original series and, and The Next Generation, and um, I just started watching Deep Space Nine, and I think... Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I've, I've said this before on a previous panel, but um, that, that pilot episode of Deep Space Nine is incredibly psychological, and I love that they didn't bring in a human psychiatrist or psychologist to, um, to tell the story of um, living in the past and, and trying to recover from trauma. And um, it, it's just an incredible way to, uh, to, to invite us to think about our own journey and um, when we're kind of stuck, which is a real, again, it's a neurobiological thing when we're stuck with this terrible thing that's happened to you. And so the way that, that the wormhole aliens kind of um, teach us about that is is incredible, and it's it's a basically it's it's a psychological um, lesson, and it's it's done in a really cool way. So I r I really like that about that. Y you know what else I like about Star Wars? It helped bring Star Trek back. <laughs> 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 and now we're returning the favor. Yeah. I think we're going to have to cut it at that one. Um, I am dying to know though who's fighting in your scenario. Yeah. We're going to bring on uh, Princess Leia as the bounty hunter versus, versus Uhura. Um, wait, is this a fight? It's, it's, a it's still a fight question. I thought for sure there would be a psychology thing in there, but no. Uh, Who, wait, we got one more. Right. Yeah, they psychological can, you, battle. Not intentional comedy. There was Jar Jar. This, whoa, we said or whatever the hell he says. <laughs> I'm not going there. Well, the, you know, the interesting thing is Star Wars is funny in a different way. Do you find Raiders of the Lost Ark to be funny? Because I look at it as a comedy. Yeah. It's hilarious. You know, it's subtly funny. You know, I mean, come on. The fir you, first you meet Harrison Ford. He's the coolest guy on the planet, and then suddenly he falls in a pit. And so far, he's done everything. He's been cool. But he falls in the pit, he grabs the rope, he smiles. And then the next thing, he, the, the rope gives, and he's got this face like, Mommy! You know? <laughs> he's very funny through those movies. And Star Wars has that humor. It's a little, you know, it's, it's a little bit more subtle. Whereas Star Trek um, has tribbles and ridiculous situations that the crew... <laughs> uh, Star Trek Four, for God's sakes. That movie is hysterical. That's the movie that got me into Star Trek, like, yeah. permanently. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because the characters were so funny and charming, and I was like, well, what else have they done? Turns out, <laughs> quite a bit. Um, Yoda's really funny. Yoda's super funny, you know. Judge me by my size, do you? Um, I think a lot of his lines in Empire are really funny. I think Han Solo's really funny. I, I think there might be a little bit less humor in uh, the prequels. I'll give you that. A little bit. Uh, well... <laughs> You, you know what, what, what is funny, though, is Clone Wars. Clone Wars is super funny. Clone Wars is funny. Anyone, who, are the, okay, who hasn't seen Clone Wars here? You guys, you guys got to go see Clone Wars. You watch Clone Wars, and you will be begging for a animated Star Trek series relaunch. We need that. We need a, <laughs> another animated really series. Cool. Awesome, guys. Well, um, I, that, that's all the time that we have, uh, and I'm not too proud to say uh, or to cop out and say... I think we've all won this debate. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank our panelists. I want to thank you guys for coming out. Enjoy May the, the force live long and prosper. Enjoy the rest of your con, guys. Thanks for coming.